So this presentation aims to look at barriers to maximum, uh, maximising economic recovery in our industry and it explores different concepts to try and overcome some of the issues that we face. So essentially this presentation tonight is aimed to provoke thought and discussion. So up to 2013, 41 billion barrels of oil and gas were produced from the UK continental shelf. At the same time, it was estimated that a further 20 plus billion barrels remained untapped. During this presentation, we'll look at the importance of improved integrity management performance and achieving maximum economic recovery. So, production efficiency is a term used to compare the actual production figures in the UK CS to the maximum theoretical production potential. It's therefore um, a measure of the total volume of hydrocarbons produced yearly as a percentage of the maximum economic production potential. Production efficiency is a key indi uh, indicator within our industry and it's regarded as a core element of asset stewardship performance. In a period between 2008 and 2012, which you can see on the graph here, production efficiency spiralled to a low of 60% of the maximum theoretical potential. In the same period, overall production in the UK continental shelf fell by 38%. So following this, it was deemed that urgent action was necessary um, to address serious underlying problems of complexity and inefficiency in our industry. So in June 2013, the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change announced a review of economic recovery in the UK continental shelf. In response to this, between 2013 and 2014, the Maximising Economic Recovery Review, or the Wood Review, was published. The Wood Review recognises the importance of improved long-term integrity management strategy and delivering improvements towards MER. As an output of the Wood Review, the Oil and Gas Authority became an, an executive agency in 2015 and MER strategy was rolled out into legislation in 2016. So since the call for improvement to achieve maximum economic recovery, there have been five consecutive years of production efficiency increase. From a low of 60% in 2012, production efficiency as of the latest report in July 2017 sits at 74%. The 1% increase in production efficiency between 2017, uh, 2016 and 2017 resulted in an increased production of 12 million barrels. So considering there have been significant improvements over the last number of years, what role do we have as integrity managers to continue progressing to achieve this year's target of 80% production efficiency? Well, in integrity management, we have a direct connection to various areas. Plant losses relating to topside equipment and export losses relating to pipeline infrastructure and terminals are two key areas which, despite improvements year on year, still result in the most substantial production losses. Roughly half of all production losses come uh, in these categories come from unplanned downtime. It should be noted that these figures take into account various forms of different production losses, and although a portion cannot be attributed to integrity failures, a sizable area of opportunity remains. To put these production loss figures into an integrity management context, the failure and resulting two-week shutdown of the 40s pipeline system in December 2017 resulted in a 12 million barrel production loss for the year, 
That equates to 6% of overall production losses for 2017. Unplanned downtime often arises from events that could have or should have been predicted. Right, cheers Paul. Um, yeah, as uh, Paul mentioned, we often see, not always, but sometimes see um, kind of failures or needing to take planned shutdowns due to the fact that equipment gets in such a poor state that it's not safe. But often when we do like root cause analysis or look back, it could have been, it could have easily been spotted and prevented long before it got there. So I've actually picked uh, well, I was kind of originally thinking, why does that happen? Why, when most of us have probably known about rust and corrosion of carbon steel, certainly since high school, if not university, it's not exactly uncommon. Plenty of things rust your car, your railings on your house, whatever. It's not unknown, but it still keeps catching us out. It still keeps catching operators out. But not only the oil and gas industry, it catches other industries out, which is why I deliberately put this picture, just to prove it's not just uh, offshore that get caught out. This is, uh, I lifted this from the BBC website from, it was from a year or two ago. That's, uh, if you don't recognise the fuzzy bit in the background, that is Aberdeen. Um, Aberdeen Council did an inspection of their lamp posts. Uh, they found in 2014, they found that 94 were in such a bad state they needed to replace them due to safety concerns. They then went back and looked at some others. They found another 110 were in such a bad state that they needed to factor in their replacement. So this is something that could have been predicted. I mean, if you actually look back, Aberdeen Council had this problem in the late 90s. So why do these things keep catching us out when we know that they're going to happen? So that's the kind of question I wanted to look at and maybe not answer, but certainly why does this keep happening? So, and it's also worth noting, that's from the EI guidance, that if, particularly if you're looking at external corrosion, yeah, you can not do anything for quite a long time. You know, don't bother maintaining your paint coating. It's probably going to be safe. You've probably got three mil of corrosion allowance to play with, even a bit more once you've done FFS and all the other things. But the reality is, the longer you leave it getting into such a poor state, the more expensive it is. So it's safety and economics. You know, the longer you leave it and you don't actually maintain it like you should, the worse the state it gets in and it's going to cost you more money. Um, so, why do I think that, that potentially might be happening? <coughs> One of the big issues, I believe, certainly in this industry, but I think there's probably endemic across a lot of industries, is co corporate short-termism. Um, and there's his, your man about to fall off a tree as he's easily chopping it down. But I think that's a reasonable metaphor for how a lot of these companies behave at times. So I dug into this a little bit more to look at kind of this kind of whole corporate short-termism problem, or is it a problem, and what other work studies have been put out there. And it actually, it so happens that McKinsey, the uh, management consultants, actually looked at this in kind of 2016, published a report early 2017, where what they did was they went and um, questioned a significant amount of uh, executives in companies. I think it was mostly in the States, but uh, global, but across all sectors, automobile, chemicals, um, software, IT, pharma, not just oil and gas. And they asked them a few questions about how they felt short-termism behaviour was affecting their companies, etc. And these are some of the results. So 87% of executives came back and said that they felt there was a pressure for strong financial performance within less than two years for their company. They also felt that certainly post uh, uh, the kind of downturn, that short-term pressure had increased in the past five years. So they felt that out, outside factors, shareholders, etc., were pushing them to look at a more short-term strategies. And this one is kind of pretty mad and shocking when you really think about it. That 55% of the people interviewed in these kind of boardrooms, etc., actually came back and said that if the company didn't have a strong long-term culture, then it was likely to delay a new project to hit quarterly um, targets, even if it sacrificed some value to the company over the long term. 
So just think about that. People are prioritizing quarterly KPIs and the like over long-term 10-year, 20-year growth. So, I mean, the, the report goes on to look at other factors, but they generally felt that um, companies with a long-term, mid to long-term strategies tended to perform better, certainly from a stock market point of view, over a kind of significant period. And it's worth noting that this isn't a new thing. Um, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, noted that short-termism in the 30s with financial investors was a big driver of people investing in stocks. So this isn't exactly a new thing. But there's some interesting insights about to why it happens. So looking at a bit into kind of behavioral economics, not exactly kind of common ground for a general institute equation type thing, but it's interesting all the same to look at these kind of inbuilt human factors about why we do things. So I'll pose a question, would you choose to accept 50 pounds now or 100 pounds in two days time? Fairly no brainer I think, the majority would choose to wait the two days to get 100 pounds. So let's pose the question again, would you choose to accept 50 pounds now or 100 pounds in a year's time? Most people will go for the 50 pounds now. And then if we take that to the other extreme and you go, would you accept 100 pounds in 10 years or would you um, accept 50 pounds in nine? I think most people would go, well, I may as well wait the 10 years and get 100 pounds rather than taking 50 at nine. It's so long into the future. And when you actually plot all that, that's what the kind of curve looks like. So the discount factor is effectively the estimate of how much something is worth if it's uh, received in the future. So you automatically, as a human, you know you have a finite life. You also know with money, if you take it now, you can invest it, get interest, buy things with it. So you kind of deliberately, in the back of your mind, you discount things that you get in the future against things now. So actually, if you come out right here, um, this is like kind of far out in time. If I said in 100 years, I would give you a million quid, or in 90 years, I'd give you 10,000 or whatever, you'd probably just call me like, what are you on? I'm not going to be around in 100 years, so who cares? You've kind of discounted it basically to nothing. It'd be very different if I offered you a million pounds tomorrow. Um, but this has really key impacts on a lot of our life decisions. It explains why a lot of us will rack up debt on credit cards for buying stuff now, even at a high interest rate, but we won't save for our pensions later on, or when we do, it's at a rubbish interest rate. It also explains why they've done studies in America on health and coronary heart um, bypass surgery. In that case, if you have that surgery due to that, um, you require it, it only works if you then make the necessary lifestyle changes to diet, fitness, etc., for you to carry on and live your life without needing further surgery or worse. But they actually find only 10% of people actually make those changes. 90% of people still default back into, oh, there's a nice cake there, I'll eat it, even though they know they shouldn't be, but it's there and they want it. <laughs> And it's, it comes back to this whole point about humans will always favour things now over into the future unless you're very kind of aware of it. It also has some interesting things if you're buying a sofa, you know, those classic deals. It comes into marketing a lot. If you actually look at it, if you're buying a sofa on kind of like interest-free credit, take it home now, pay in a year's time, that's all about selling it to you on this because you want the sofa now and then you have to think about paying a grand or whatever in, a, in the future. So this is kind of inbuilt into humans and it takes quite a lot of uh, kind of insight for you to probably break out of what is your natural kind of default setting. And this is for all of us. But why, why do we even care about this from a corrosion integrity management point of view? Well, we care because senior management are likely to cut costs and prioritise quick wins where they can, they are likely to go for reactive over preventative maintenance because it satisfies their need for doing something now, not getting a gain in two, three years' time. That's despite the fact that we all know, and I showed it earlier, that it's actually more cost effective often to look to these mid to long term plans. And as I said, 
you know, often a lot of integrity improvements. You change out spools, you paint stuff, you do all this good work, change the insulation. You don't instantly get a quick win. So it's quite hard for us as integrity corrosion engineers to go to management and explain the benefits that they're going to get from it because um, they're not going to see that short-term value. They might have moved on in a year's time. They might be off to the next operator or up onto a different part of the corporate chain. So they're looking for quick wins that they can sell to their own management and get promoted, etc. And the problem is things like FM programs aren't generally seen as quick wins. So we need to think of a way of getting around this problem. If we as integrity corrosion engineers want to get funding from our kind of management for doing these programs. So these are some strategies for moving to mid to long termism in your kind of um, organization or presenting to your kind of the organization that maybe you're subcontracted from. I'm not saying they're the only ones, people might come up with their ideas, but these are some ideas. So break your work down into smaller manageable tasks, each with defined goals. So like if any of you have ever kind of climbed up a hill, gone, uh, done a marathon or whatever, you know that, I know what, marathon's 26 and a bit miles, you know that's actually a long way. Thinking about trying to run for 26 miles is probably not a thought you really want to contemplate. But if you can break it down into mile chunks or five mile chunks, suddenly it becomes a lot easier to manage and you're just thinking your way through it. And before you know it, you've finished and you've got your winner's medal and that foil blanket to stop you getting hypothermia. So that's where you are, but you need to think about how you can apply this in your kind of work environment. So if you're thinking about FM, it'd be like, rather than saying, oh, there's a three year program to paint all the oil plant, maybe like try and um, break it down into, oh, we've painted this module, isn't that good? Or we've painted this corrosion circuit. Or however you're kind of managing your task, try and break it down into these smaller chunks so that you can actually demonstrate that you're progress into management. And it makes you feel better because you know you're making progress. Saying that we're going to start a three, four year campaign to paint the entire asset is probably a bit of a kind of mammoth ask that's probably going to crush you a little bit after a year or two. And also, when you've done these, communicate and celebrate success. So here I am, I was, I was in the Christmas period, went up a hill, um, took a photo to celebrate that I'd been up there. Celebrate success. So what we're talking about, s send it to your friends, whatever. In this particular instance, I think I had a Haribo or something as well to celebrate. It was that exciting. Um, but then communicate these things, not just like within your team, but also with out, outside your team, across your organization. You know, tell the ops guys, tell the guys who are on the operations team in your kind of ocean or in wherever can Lloyd's whatever PIM you know the you know you're all working in different areas celebrate that you've got success and then people will recognize it and build on it and I think it pr creates quite a positive environment about that we're making a difference as integrity and corrosion engineers so doing all that I then didn't follow up my own good work that's the text I sent from when I got to the top of the hill I'll be honest with you not the most positive message I've ever sent out so probably do as, I, do as I say, don't do as I do, but there is an important message with that. I think we all have like slight cultural differences. There's quite a lot of countries represented here. I think particularly as British people who are maybe a bit reserved, don't always celebrate success particularly well. If you've got an American in here, I feel they'd probably be a lot more positive on board with this kind of idea. They're generally a lot more positive, but I'm sure you're aware of different cultures have different um, kind of different aspects around communicating and celebrating success. So that's something to consider. And then also looking, thinking a bit more business case. Um, you know, if you've got good data, the better the data you've got, the more you can build into going to your management with a proper kind of program that you can sell to them. So how is the, this FM program? How is this CUI program? How is it going to reduce their risk? How is it going to improve their asset? Um, have we got a good idea on the cost and resources it's going to need? Now that needs um, quite a lot of upfront data, but you know if you, you can do it potentially. There's a lot of um, if you go on the NACE website, they did an impact study. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff you can go on and look on the NACE site. You don't need to be a member. Go on and look at that. There's a lot of bit on looking at um, ROI and net present value, and there's all these complicated math things you can do to justify why this program might be a good idea, but I'm not going to go into that now, but um, go and have a look if you're interested. And also, if you can get your management to commit to mid to long term integrity management programs for improvement, that is generally a good thing. 
there's plenty of evidence to suggest that once you've got management to buy into a program that's a year to to kind of back out of it because they've given commitment to the business etc that they're going to follow through so they need a much stronger justification for backing out of it so that's um those are some ideas i'm sure you can maybe you might have examples of where some of these have worked or maybe other examples of maybe where you could implement them and finally the other bit which brings us on to the um the kind of bit of the talk i'm going to hand back to paul the other way we can look to try and develop these strategies is through the buzzword that came up from the Wood uh, report, which is collaboration. That's definitely, if you're collaborating between companies within your company, that definitely has to be a more mid to long term strategy because you've got to build the relationships to make the collaboration work. So let's kind of do a little bit of discussion of collaboration and then I'll hand back to the more kind of integrity side to Paul. So the Oxford English Dictionary definition of collaboration is the action of working with someone to produce something. It's similar to cooperation, but it's not the same as co cooperation. Here I've got an example from, it's kind of a topical example with the Six Nations starting this weekend, so I um, picked a rugby example. Um, I don't sound it, but I am Welsh, so I'm, I'm backing the guys on the left in red. Um, but basically... Anyone who knows anything about rugby knows that kind of Wales, England's a pretty uh, highly fought contest. Uh, no quarters generally given. They've played over 130 games between themselves over 100 years. The win count is 62 to England, 57 to Wales. So it's, it's a very competitive fixture. However, if you look at the Rugby World Cup titles, seven Rugby World Cups have been won by Southern Hemisphere teams. So we're talking Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Only one's been won by a Northern Hemisphere team, and that was England, with that Johnny Wilkinson drop goal. But they realised there's a World Cup later this year, October uh, 2019 uh, in Japan. They realised back in early, mid to early 2017 that if England and Wales wanted to get closer and give themselves a chance of beating the likes of New Zealand and Australia at the 29 World Cup, they needed to think of different ways of training to make training more competitive you know normally i suppose the typical way of training would be you put your a team against your b team and train that way but they found they couldn't actually get a level of intensity that you're going to get in a full international match when you're playing the likes of new zealand and it's like fun in your face so they came up with the idea of they'd actually collaborate even though over 100 years these fierce rivals over a couple of days they collaborated to try and improve the level of rugby that they were playing at so they did i know i can't remember what the numbers are uh, 12 12 full-on scrums ref by a professional referee with no quarter given as though they were in a proper international and they did 15 line outs um, to try and get that intensity and improve them obviously we don't know what the improvement is yet we'll find out in kind of october november how well wales and england go in japan and whether they beat the southern hemisphere but they're thinking at, at collaboration certainly in that aspect they hope will bring them closer to winning the World Cup. So, on that note, I will hand over to, back to Paul and he will talk you through how collaboration in integrity management can make a big difference. Thank you, Ed. So is collaboration already working in our industry? Do we already collaborate? Well collaboration isn't a new concept. The potential benefits both outside and inside our industry have been, have been known for a long time. If we continue to be aware of collaboration and its benefits, why doesn't it deliver more for us? Well I think some of that can be explained through looking at the way that we typically um, perform in integrity management. So typically we work in an environment where in order to reach a desired goal, an operator will enlist a number of specialist contractors with e different areas of expertise in various different areas. Sometimes instead of promoting better collaboration, this type of relationship 
can result in a service demander and a service supplier type relationship between organisations. This may lead to situations where the opportunity for optimisation between involved parties is limited and generally then performance improvements are driven primarily through supply chain cost squeezing. So how can we go about trying to implement better collaboration and in integrity management? Well, we could look at the way that we interact with each other and we should make a concerted effort to form joint efficiency teams, either across organisations or within our organisations. So the concept of a joint efficiency team is that decision making can be synchronised through better alignment of goals. Information sharing can be improved through more transparent communication channels and uh, best practice can be adopted by utilising combined experience and expertise. Generally using a, a model like this, um, better in sharing between parties. So I'd like to introduce a brief example where I think better collaboration could be utilised through joint efficiency teams to deliver improved integrity results. CUI has been a, a challenge in our industry, it always has been. Over 20% of major oil and gas incidents reported within the EU since 1984 are associated with CUI. Today in the North Sea, it's reported that 60% of pipework failures are caused by CUI. So the Oil and Gas Technology Centre have a vision to completely eliminate CUI failures by 2026 and are looking for technology, ideas and concepts to make this happen. Evidence which I've witnessed in my time in the industry suggests that corrosion under insulation, passive fire protection or deck penetrations is often, uh, is often tackled using reactive campaigns which are often triggered by safety concerns, regulator attention or high profile failures leading to significant outages. This then leads to a knee jerk reaction to predict, detect, inspect for and mitigate CUI. We then tackle CUI using campaigns, using a traditional integrity business model which I've already been through and generally here there will be various different teams, there will be an integrity management contractor team, an inspection team and a, a fabric maintenance team amongst others. Generally speaking these are led by different leadership teams, different project managers, project engineers. That can lead to goals which aren't aligned. It can lead to um, different motivations. This traditional method often ends up using multiple different data sets across all the different teams that we've set up and generally tracking and reporting of progress is based on man hours and cost only. So here are some of the most common examples we continually meet when dealing with CUI using CUI campaigns. What if we could uh, adopt a longer term approach to this? and approach CUI using a collaborative joint efficiency approach instead. In doing so, we could achieve better decision making through um, a dedicated project manager, ensuring aligned goals with greater visibility of ov the overall process and targets. Better control of data sets by aligning overall, uh, by assigning a, an overall data owner this would ensure an accurate and comprehensive foundation for uh, CUI improvement. 
and instead of tracking only by cost and man hours, we could track and report progress based on real-time risk reduction, ultimately enabling better decision making in the long run. So um, MER improvements due to better integrity management are likely to come from improvements either or both to CUI or pressure vessel inspection performance. In order to tackle these complex, issue, complex issues we face as an industry, we must work together to form closer relationships to enable uh, the use of more mid to long term strategy. PIM are committed to improving collaborative relationships both in-house and with clients and fellow service providers. Thank you very much.